somebody get up and go and buy a bucket fill it with cold soap and water somebody scrub your body clean with a sponge learn to be a better son or daughter that was better sons and daughters by maggie del rey I'm Dakota Antelman, and this is Three Pounds of Pure Culture, the podcast where I take you in-depth into local and hyper-local music that gets its life in the smallest of venues from here to Boston. We're six episodes into this podcast, and up until now, we've been digging deep into the docket of bands currently active in the area. Today, however, we're looking at a musician that is doing it all herself. Her name is Maggie Del Rey. She's a senior at Algonquin High School in Northboro who dropped nearly 30 original songs over a 16-month span from June 2017 to November 2018. Standing around her vocals and guitar, Del Rey's music is nothing short of beautiful, but the process of making it has hardly been easy. We have a very special interview with Del Rey later on the show, but first, joining me live in the studio to break her music down is my friend and fellow music nerd, Buffy Catella. Buffy, welcome to the show. Hello! Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So some background, Maggie Del Rey is a solo act out of Northboro. Before her solo work, she contributed uh, to the band Ceilings as a guitarist. She's also been involved in some other uh, musical projects since then. Uh, she's still a guitarist uh, in a band that performs intermittently. Recently, however, it's all been her for the most part in terms of what's actually been getting uh, on the internet, on Spotify, uh, with stuff that's been being released. She writes and sings her own lyrics, plays guitar, piano, and drums. She dropped three albums on Spotify and Bandcamp and has posted covers of everyone from Blink-182 to the front bottoms on her YouTube page. Her most recent album, Everything Not Nailed Down, came out in November of last year, just a matter of weeks after her house and the majority of, possession of her possessions, including almost all of her music equipment, burned down in an electrical fire. She finished editing that album on her GarageBand app on her phone, and so she drew on many of the emotions swirling after that personal disaster in creating what she describes as an album with a few songs left rough around the edges. So, hearing all that and getting the chance to listen to her stuff, as I know you've done over the past few weeks, what is your first impression of Maggie? Okay, so let me break this down. So first off, Dakota said to me, he's like, oh, I found this artist that I think you'd really like. So I have a pretty wide range of music I listen to. I can listen to some hard rock and some folk and country, country, literally whatever. I'll listen to whatever, except if it's rapper. That's besides the point. Um, and he's like, oh, there's this really good artist that I think you'd like. She, I went to journalism camp with her, and she's from Northboro, and she's really good. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll find her at Spotify. And he played me her first, like the start of her first album in the car, and I was just shook. And I, and I don't really nerd out about music. Well, I do nerd out about music. Yeah, but like, not <laughs> specific. There's a select few of artists that I really am like, passionate about and I feel like I have found a hidden gem on the internet of the most amazing like I, I can't can't even fathom everything that she does it's th but the fact that she's able to write her own music mix it all together and play all the instruments boggles my mind and she does it so incredibly well and I kind of compared it to so I know we've, we've talked about this band, Future Teens, they're really good. Um, that they're yeah, they've been on. They've been we featured them in the show before. They they've been on the show. Okay, yeah. Future Teens, really good band. So the first time I heard them, I had like this feeling of like this is like childhood and young adultness and everything in lyrics, and I'm obsessed with it. And that's how I feel about Maggie. I haven't been able to stop listening. There's a few songs that I just have had stuck in my head constantly. I am just such a fan and I really hope I get to meet her because I, I'm gonna fangirl so and I know she's only 17 but she is spectacular and I think that she could be a star one day. Those are my first impressions. That was a lot. There you go. No, it was it was a great first impression. A great first impression indeed from me too. I mean I'll 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 give my background uh, you know Buffy Buffy shed light. Um, Maggie and I first met through a journalism uh, camp. We both worked uh, on our high school student newspapers, and we met through a journalism camp, journalism conference uh, that we did. I didn't know at the time that she was doing music, uh, but I guess at that time, uh, she was quietly working on and releasing this stuff. Um, she reached out to me when I started my own band recently uh, about that, and we got to talking. I got to looking at her music, and I really had a lot of the same you know, first, in, first impressions that yeah. you had. 
This music is beyond that of anyone this age. Uh, we've profiled our share of young mus musicians on this podcast. As I said, I'm one myself. Uh, I've done best my done best to sound passable and legit, uh, you <laughs> yes. know, as a band yeah. in, a greater, in the greater Boston music scene. But I am under no illusions that I or really anything else, or, or yeah, really anything else we've shown in this podcast comes close in kind of the quality of the content yeah. uh, that Maggie is putting out. It is absolutely stellar. You know. Her voice, you know, the right off the best. Her yeah. voice is amazing. It is clean, it's melodic, but it has this kind of powerful dynamic that she's doing. She doesn't sound 70. Like, she's, like, the first, I had no idea. You, If you played that for me, I'd be like, it's like a 30-year-old woman or Absolutely. something. Absolutely. Yeah, keep going, sorry. Um, she, you know, then we then we dig into the instrumentals. You know, on 9 out of 10 songs, the guitar is the most prominent. But that does not mean that, you know, the other instruments are not yep. present. She plays piano very well. Yeah. Uh, you know, Buffy loves her piano playing. You know, she she has drums. She plays drums very well. Even though she, uh, you know, said in uh, our interview, uh, the drums are probably her weakest instrument. Her drums on these songs are, you know, anchoring yeah. these things. Uh, you know, she plays bass. You know, you hear some of that in there. Yeah. You know, and it's 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 absolutely fantastic, and it accents that guitar and the vocals brilliantly. I totally agree. You know, and then and 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 then of course we get into the editing. You know, particularly on her most recent albums, uh, uh, Everything Not Nailed Down and Freak Out Your Friends. Amazing. This displays a brilliant command of kind of audio editing as an art form. And that's yeah. something that I think gets overlooked a lot. You know, with every band up until now that we've profiled on this podcast, even the young bands, they're recording their stuff in the studio. They're not necessarily editing their own yeah. stuff. And it is hard. It is hard yeah. to edit. It is hard to mix. Again, I'll say, I certainly don't know how to do it right. Uh, she does the yeah. layer the, like I, I and just there's not even professionals that can get that down the fact that she can layer her songs with so many not just vocals but she's layering with different instruments and the piano and all these different elements because I feel like if you were just if you're in a band it's a little different because everyone kind of does plays their own part but she's able to literally do whatever she wants because it's all her. It's amazing. It's spectacular. Amazing. Well, you, you, you know, I, I haven't, I, you know, I, I talked to her trying to get a sense of how she's putting these yeah. songs together. But honestly, you know, on first impression, when you're listening to this music, and if you really get into kind of the music nerd, yeah. um, you know, mindset of how, how is this being done? How would this possibly translate to a live yeah. performance? You'd need probably 10 people on that stage exactly. to bring all the layers and complexity that she has to life. And yet, it's 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 a true masterpiece. It's yeah. something that she again she's going to bring it up in the interview. They've tried to do her music live. She's tried to do her music live with some of her other bands, and it just doesn't necessarily translate because she is creating this recording art. Yep. It is you know she's these massively complex songs yep. uh, that can only be done with you know I she, she's very humble about her you know skills you know including the audio editing yep. skills. I brought this up. You know, she won't necessarily, uh, you know, come out and say this, but she has brilliant audio editing skills, um, ju and that's evident just from hearing these songs. But so obviously, I could go on talking about this forever. I know Buffy, you could, uh, yeah. But I want to keep this uh, moving along. We've uh, we've binge listened to a bunch of her songs. What would you say is her favorite, or is your favorite, not her favorite? I don't know what her favorite <laughs> song is, Dakota. Um, I would say, oh, this is a hard one because I like the song that you're gonna choose, but I'm. Okay, I've, can I just name a few that yeah, I sure, really yeah. like? Okay, so I really like My Friend. Like, I was just listening to it before the podcast, and I freaking love it. Like, so good. It's been stuck in my head all day. Um, I really like Ghosts. That's really good. Um, I really like The Rapture. And, yeah, those are, those are the ones. I feel like I'm missing one that I really like, too. But those are three top, my three yeah. top ones. And I just, they're all so different. The, I think... If you just look at her newest album, um, everything not nailed down. Yeah, everything not nailed down. I just love like the way I'm. I'm a true believer in listening to music, it the way it's supposed to be in an album. I think that an artist creates an album and wants you to listen to songs in a certain way, exactly. and she does that perfectly with the album. The progression from you start off, the album starts off very slow, but as you keep going, it revs up, gets faster, more intense. And the last song, song The Rapture, is a complete bop. Like, I jam to it. I, I just keep going. The piano that gets in the, oh, the piano. 
I heard the piano and I like jumped. I was like, this is the best thing I've I've ever heard. I feel like I'm very much geeking no, out right now. No, no, this, okay. is, this is wonderful. Okay. You, you, you mentioned the piano there and, and you mentioned the progression. It is something where it feels like, you know, the first song in the album, um, I believe is uh, is called Rain Hitting the Windows Part, well, part yeah. 1. Um, and that song, very, uh, you know, it's some drums in there, yep. vocals, guitar. Those are the three main pieces. Yep. But you get you, you get to the end of the album, you know, something like Fear, yep. something like The Fear. Rapture, yep. um, where you have piano, you have bass, you have guitar, you have the guitar screaming, you have layered guitars, you have all of these vocal harmonies. Yep. It's almost like, again, you, you, you know, I, I like envisioning live music. You yep. know, a lot of this podcast, that going back episodes, I like to try to see these bands live. Um, because I think that's an important part, particularly of local music. Now, I've said Maggie is, per, her solo stuff is mostly recording art, but, it, it, you know, kind of as a thought experiment and kind of envisioning what her music would look like live, it's almost as like she starts out alone on stage and then by the end of the album she has this whole orchestra behind her. Yes. That's kind of what the album feels yeah. like, at least in my head as I'm listening to it. It's just building, it's just growing, the sound is getting thicker and more yeah. complicated. And I think it just, it's its such a, it, it's an experience listening to that. Now that's particularly Everything Not Nailed Down, which I think is yeah. the best album. I 100% agree. It's pure, that album, you can, and if you listen to all her old stuff too, you can, you can totally see how much she's improved. But that album specifically, I believe is just pure perfection. Like yeah. from, obviously it would be amazing if she had professional equipment, but from, it doesn't even, it, it's not like it's missing it. It almost gives it a vibe. Do you know, it gives it a vibe like it, it's so important that it doesn't need to be. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It doesn't need to be this high tech thing. It's it's just it's so raw. It's amazing. Well, that's something you know. I'll 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 get on my pedestal here. Yeah. I think uh, it's 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 often very hard for young musicians to record music and release music yep. and get it heard and seen in this commercialized music industry that yep. we have right now. And I think someone like Maggie can provide such hope in being able to create just really high quality music with GarageBand, a single mic, and you know... So many instruments. And, yeah. and, and a few instruments. Um, you know, I, I want to share this anecdote I was telling you before we turned yeah. the camera on. In, in, in the interview, I don't know uh, if this is going to get included in, in what we play of this interview, but Maggie told me, you know, all she's recording, she does not have a fancy mic, she doesn't have, you know, all, all, all she's recording all of this on is her Apple um, uh, iPhone earbuds. That is the only mic she's using to record these entire albums. And that is just a testament to, you know, this is proof that you can record really high quality music if you have good editing yep. skills and if you can play and if you can play your instruments right and if you know how to structure a song. And I think that's something, again, you know, I, I'm going to make no claims that I know how to do that. I'm going to make no claims that, you know, most of the people yep. we've profiled on this podcast could could do that without the help of kind of this music, this broader music industry. Yeah. Maggie's doing it all herself, Amazing. and I have so much respect yeah. for that. and I think one thing we should touch on is, are her lyrics. Her lyrics are, um, in the fact that, and I think this is a good segue into Better Sons and yeah. Daughters, um, her lyrics are so powerful and amazing. I, I think, just typically, if you turn on the radio, many of the songs you're listening to are just kind of generic lyrics, they're catchy, but they're not. They don't have any meaning. But I feel like every Maggie song, even if you go back to her oldest album, each song has lyrics that mean something. There's meaning to it, and it's a whole another emotional connection to it. And I especially felt that way for Better Sons and Daughters, which yeah. is your favorite song. Yeah. So, 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 b one more thing before setting up my my, my brief discussion yeah. of Better Sons and Daughters, talking about meaning. She, she has three albums. Two yeah. of them are concept albums. The first album is a concept album. Second album, Freak Out Your Friends, is a concept album. Third album, she wrote as a kind of less conceptual album, more just kind of a conglomeration of, of individual songs that yeah. came from the heart. She was talking about writing some, some fictional songs, particularly inspired by the band The Mountain Goats. Um, that song, though, kind of took on a concept feel in the wake of the fire. Um, and, you, you know, having all of her music equipment destroyed, having her life uprooted, by that catastrophic fire, mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden she was talking about how some people, even though those songs were written before the fire, those songs suddenly took on a sort of meaning, were viewed through that lens, um, had that feel. Those first two albums, though, uh, Soda Pop is her debut album, 
uh, and freak out your friends are two concept albums. Soda Pop, uh, as we'll get into, is about a tragedy involving her father. Um, her father passed away due to some mental health issues. Um, and she wrote that, that album was kind of a dedication to him. Uh, and it is a, it is a beautiful album, totally from the heart. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to listen to some of the music, um, but is, is just awe-inspiring that she could channel that kind of tragedy into an art form like that. Freak Out Your Friends, likewise, is a little bit lighter, but, um, you know, is talking about just friends, you know, talking about, you know, a social life in high school and, you know, what's going on for her. So two concept albums there, yeah. um, you know, and as obviously we touched on what Everything Not Nailed Down is about. But Better Sons and Daughters, the lead track off of uh, Freak Out Your Friends is a fantastic song. Um, arguably, I think, her best. Arguably her best song. Absolutely, yeah, yes. 100%. And so, you know, my my two biggest notes on this one are, are, are just the foundational songwriting skills that we talked about yeah. and her vocals, you know. The words she writes and the way she sings them. She structures this song absolutely br brilliantly. Uh, you know, she builds from this stripped down acoustic first verse uh, and chorus up into this more cacophonous yeah. and lyrically aggressive ending. You know, those vocals, they start smooth and gentle, but then they kind of seamlessly transition into these belted, again, layered, dense yes. choruses. That personally just knocked my socks off, and I think they did the same <laughs> yes. for you. You know, the, the lyrics are truly brilliant. And, you know, as a whole, it's about kind of feeling like a disappointment to your parents, uh, yet she kind of buries these, you know, kind of that broader theme, uh, you know, under these brilliantly shocking lines, uh, including lyrics like this one. I'm going to read it. Uh, quote, sometimes I want to claw, claw out my eyes with a razor blade until I think of what my mom would have to say. Just a just beautiful. beautiful dichotomy. It's just shocking. You're listening to it. You're like, whoa. And then you hear that line until I think of what my mom would have to say. Um, you know, on a literary level, that is brilliant. And it is, it keeps you captivated. Again, this is the first song in the album. You hear a line like that. You hear a verse like that. You are hooked. Um, and I think that's kind of the broad experience. This is not something that's unique. Yep. The Better Sons and Daughters. This is my favorite song, but that that songwriting skill is on everything. And can I just talk about that song? Because yeah. like literally, just hearing it, that hearing that song for the first time, it's 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 all the emotions I think a teenager feels. They feel like I'm not good enough. Like my parents hate me. I'm not good enough. And it's it's the most real thing in that I could. I can't even describe how real it is because of just. It, it is it is what we all feel. We've all seen better sons and daughters, and we never feel like we're good enough. And I think it's the most relatable song out there. And the layers, you're right, those layers of that song, the way it picks up in the end of the song um, is the most emotional thing where um, I want... You're going to play it next, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there, I won't spoil it. But the end of the song gets me every time, and I just want to... It, it's... It's like, this is a weird comparison, but there's the Taylor Swift song, All Too Well, and there's a part of that song where you just want to belt the end of Better Sons and Daughters. I just want to scream at the top of my lungs. It's that good. So those are my thoughts. Absolutely. Well, obviously, as you can tell, Buffy and I adore this I, music. I we, you know, love Maggie Del Rey as a artist. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, we could talk forever, but I think, uh, you know, it's best to hear, uh, you know, most about her music in her words. It's best to hear some more of her music itself. Um, we're going to take that chance now to play more of that song, Better Sons and Daughters. You heard a snippet of it in the intro, but we're going to play the rest of that song right now. Um, so, first, though, Buffy, thanks for stopping by. Oh, thank you. No, you get a hug. All right. Oh, <laughs> uh, might as well hug on air. There we go. Talking about... Ride music that's passionate and makes oh, it's adorable. me feel yeah, it's, feelings. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful music. Um, but yeah, so we'll take the chance now to play the rest of Better Sons and Daughters by Maggie Del Rey. And come out of that song, we'll be one-on-one -on -one with Maggie herself. Stay tuned. Somebody get up and go and buy a bucket Fill it with cold soap and water Somebody scrub your body clean with a sponge Learn to be a better son or daughter Stop burning things with those guys on the street And stop spilling drinks and stop smoking weed And please stop coming home so late at night We've all seen better sons and daughters
something again Probably not With the way I feel today We've all seen better sons and daughters 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 And I don't want to make a change yet. I could see my car go in 90 on the highway And then crashing into another So I guess if we just start, how did you get into music? Um, well, I started playing guitar when I was seven. Um, my mom like forced me into lessons, and at first I very much hated it. But um, you know, mere exposure effect, I, I got really into it, and um, now I love it. It's you know really big part of my life. And when did you pick up the other thing? You know, the other instruments you're doing quite more than guitar. <laughs> Um, so it was kind of a gradual process. Josh. My brother, when I started playing guitar, he started playing bass, and my mom started playing piano at that time. Yeah. So over the years, I kind of just fiddled. Once um, they both quit, so they gave me their instruments, so then they were mine to play with. And then um, eventually, when I was a sophomore, I got a drum kit for myself, and by far my weakest instrument, but um, <laughs> I can fake it. <laughs> You do all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, um, in terms of kind of making your own music, um, how, how has that developed? I noticed um, you were in you in a band for a little while. Um, can you sort of talk about that arc of making your own music? Yeah. Um, so I started my first band in seventh grade and uh, went through a lot of member and name changes since then. Right now we're the Quixotic Monks, <laughs> yes. and there's five of us. Um, we're not particularly active right now. We lost all of our equipment, was at my house. Um, so that's gone, but we will get new stuff and start practicing again soon. But yeah, that is pretty separate from my solo work. I would say we play more like rock music, my music's folky. It has a lot more influences other than rock, I would say. Um, but it's fun. I like playing with other people. Playing with other people's fun. Yeah. Been, been sitting in the basement a lot. Yeah. Which is what I've been doing all this whole time. Uh, that's fun too. I, it's all good. Um, you mentioned the, you know, you mentioned your house, and I think that's you, you know seemed to influence some stuff, you know, particularly with your recent work. Do you want to talk about what happened to your house? Yeah. Um. So my house in November it burned down. So I lost a lot of equipment and things, and um. 
I was in the middle of working on an album, Everything Not Nailed Down. That wasn't the name yet, but that album. It was set to be released like a couple weeks later. Um, so it wasn't quite finished. There's a few songs that are still on my phone that are like recorded, but I didn't want to release because they just they're not done and they won't be until I get new equipment. Um, so I just I released what I had, and that became that album. So it's it's kind of weird. I've had some people tell me that the lyrics like on a few tracks, like friends who know me are like, wow, like it almost seems like you wrote this about the fire. Um, but obviously I wrote it before that, so I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so that happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about where the name came from? You talked about how that was something that came came to you after the fire. Yeah. Um, so I I wanted to release the music, and I knew that it would be several months before I could completely finish what I had originally intended to make. Um, but I, I did want to, you know, put something out. I, I told people I was going to put something out. Not that I have like a million fans waiting, but you know, for the, like the three people who care. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to honor that and be able to do something. So I was, you know, thinking about it and trying to get the album art together, trying to get what I could together to have it ready to go. And I was listening to my favorite band, the Mountain Goats, in my car, and they have a line in their song. Um, they say, "Save this town, save everything, not nailed down." Um, and I don't know what it was about that line, "Save everything, not nailed down," but it just, it kind of. I don't know, it spoke to me in a way of like, it could be related to my situation, it's not the intent of that song in particular, but um, yeah, it's just, I lost all my things, but those songs got out of the fire and I have them and I can share them. Um, something I made that I get to keep forever, really, so it's, yeah, it's cool to me. <laughs> um, you're kind of touching on kind of the role of music in your life there and you know, you know, getting getting to have something that, you know created like that. Um, you know, the fire obviously, you know, a tough thing to get through. And you know, you put music about your dad in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, what what role has music had in your life in terms of kind of helping you deal with tough stuff like that? Yeah. Um. For sure, it's like a huge coping thing. I first started writing music in seventh grade, and that's when I was first like diagnosed with clinical depression. Um, and it, it's just, it's a helpful tool if you're like not feeling well for sure. Um, and then just to understand like when, when things happen, like for me, it's a way to kind of step back, digest it, make it into, in a way, a positive thing. Um, like something that it can help you, it might help other people if you're really lucky. <laughs> and. Yeah, it just it helps me to understand like things that I've gone through. I mentioned your dad in there, and you know, you don't you don't have to touch on this if you don't want to, but you do you feel comfortable talking a little bit about. Yeah, I can talk a bit about that. Um, yeah, so my father was also depressed, <laughs> um, and he took his own life when I was a sophomore. So um, obviously, that was like a really big event in my life that uh, um, will affect me, you know, forever. But um, yeah, that's what kind of triggered my first like full length album. Um, still my only full length album because the other two are shorter. Um, it's called Soda Pop. And um, you know, looking back on it, I was still learning how to record things. Cause I'd written music before, but I'd never like sat down and recorded it, had all the different parts. So, you know, so some of the songs kind of made me cringe. Like, oh, I wish I fixed that. I wish I did that better. But, um, at the time it was, you know, I was really proud of it and I worked really hard on it and it, it is, it's like, it's about my father and what happened and, you know, how it affected me but also other people, I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Um, named it all after the Outsiders character? Hmm? Named it all after the Outsiders character? Oh, no. Or just a coincidence? No, I guess just a coincidence. He used to work for Coca-Cola. Oh. <laughs> and I called him Pop sometimes, so oh. I just kind of... Stuck it together. Awesome. <laughs> well, happy coincidence there too. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? Um, you know, talking. You, you know, you touched on sort of the technical aspects a little bit there. Um, you know, definitely listening through those three um, different pieces that you put out, and we definitely do here in progression. Um, how has you know from, from from kind of a technical editing standpoint? Um, you know, how has that sort of kind of music production developed for you over these years? 
So I'm far from a professional at that. <laughs> Hopefully I continue to improve. I don't have any recording equipment whatsoever. I use my cell phone and the Apple headphones that come with my cell phone. Um, and then just like raw instruments, um, maybe amplifiers for like guitars and bass um, as would be expected. Um, in the future, when I have more money <laughs> from working, um, hopefully I can buy some more professional equipment. But right now it's really just um, working with what I have and uh, you know, getting the best product that I know how to create, which is, it's not that great. I think um, one of one of the biggest flaws that I see in my own music is, you know, technical things, timing issues. It's very difficult to like hear the metronome and play and just think I get off for myself, skip a beat kind of thing. Um, and it's frustrating when like you work really, really hard on something and there's like little things like you can hear the mic muffling and like there's just not really much I can do about it. Um, but hopefully that doesn't take away too much from, yeah, what the music I was, is. I, I, I wish I was listening to them, honestly. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's kind of frustrating a lot how, like, a lot of even younger people, you know, younger bands are, like, going into studios now and recording mm -hmm. things. And I'm like, you know, until I'm looking at it, recording my own stuff, and I'm like, that kind of money? Yeah. I, like, looked into it. I was like, this is hundreds of dollars. I don't have time to do that. Yeah. And luckily I have, like, one, one nice mic. But it's even hard to do. I mean, your drums sound better than I can <laughs> drum. My drums sound like with a four yeah. color mic. So whatever you're doing is working. <laughs> yeah, the Apple headphones are pretty good. I've tried go. some other ones and they're <laughs> not not quite so good. <laughs> Something about them. That's a win. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is anyone ever is, is entirely self-taught from the, from the editing standpoint, or has anyone ever kind of helped you out with you know GarageBand and stuff? Um, I kind of just learned GarageBand by playing around with it. Once the band we went in, um, I actually have a friend, um, his name's Matt Hayden. I don't know why I said his name, no one knows who that is. He, he's like, he's an adult in like a real band, he makes music, he has a bunch of professional stuff. So he let my band come in and he helped us record some stuff and they sound great. They sound like actual songs that were like recorded professionally. Um, and he did it for free, but I felt bad because he spent hours on it. So I'm not going to ask him to like, hey, do you want to record this full length album for me? Like, yeah, I feel um, But it was cool to do once. But other than that, um, I mostly just learned it by playing around with it. That's awesome. Um, I'm still playing back a little bit to influences. You said the, the Mountain Goats, your favorite band, but you know, you're talking to your YouTube channel, you know, you're covering Front Bottoms a lot, which I love. Yeah. I adore the Front Bottoms. Um, you know, you had a Blink cover in there. Yeah. Um, so definitely like kind of an eclectic music taste. Um, where's that come from and you know, how's that influenced you? Uh, yeah, I, I love, I, I don't really have a genre, I would say. I would listen to music that I like and that is very, very broad. I mean, my two favorite bands are the Mountain Goats and the Red Hot Chili Peppers already. That's a pretty, <laughs> pretty um, <laughs> wide spectrum. On the way here, I was listening to Bowie. I love Jeff Rosenstock, his punk, punk music. A um, lot of spew, post-hardcore, just I could go on, but like I love rap, I just everything, N not so much country, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> um, but I, I think that comes across a bit in my music. I, I personally find it hard to genre myself. When people ask like what kind of music I make, I'm like, eh, it's like folk, pop, indie, kind of. That's the rock a little bit, um, which can make it difficult to like recommend my music to other people I don't know like who would like it necessarily yeah. <laughs> I think like maybe if you like the front bottoms you might if you like <laughs> the mountain goats you might I don't know um, but definitely other artists influence my music for sure but I, feel that. I have a lot of uh, strings coming together I'm trying to think there's a lot more that I want to talk about yeah um, kind of thematically you have a lot of different um, themes that you touch on, um, you know, Freak Out Your Friends, that second um, recording, a lot of, you know, friends being talked about on that, yeah. versus this most recent, you know, album, there's a lot of, you know, family stuff that you're bringing up, and, you know, obviously the home mm -hmm. lyrics. Um, <clears throat> do you, is that kind of intentional that those things come together, or, you know, like, are you in a certain mood and you seem to find yourself writing a lot of the same you know about a lot of the same themes or does that just kind of happen? Yeah, um, the first album I wrote was very intentional. It was, you know, it was telling the story all the way through where that was my goal. 
And to me, it makes sense, but to other people who didn't live it, maybe not as much. But that's okay. I mean, everyone should have their own interpretation. Um, the second, also the same. It was it was about my friends. That's what the album is about. Um, that's intentional. The third one was a bit more, uh, yeah, a li little bit more eclectic, less of a theme to it. Um, my goal with that album was to write more fiction because I tend to write about my own life. And while like that can produce some really like good emotional music, I think um, I just I don't know. I thought I'd challenge myself to do something different. I mean. Of the Mountain Goats, I don't know how familiar you are with their music, but um, one of the great things about them is how um, the main singer, John Darnielle, storytells. He makes things up and they feel so real and so good. Um, so that's what I tried to do with the last one. There's certainly songs that are about myself and my life, in my opinion, because that's what I'm used to, but there's also ones that are more fictional. So I was um, happy to be able to include those also. Um, but yeah. I, did, I didn't come up with like one theme for that album. Yeah. Oh, you, you talked about um, you know getting getting it played on the radio station there in your school. Um, and you talked about you know not a huge following, but a few people who were you know excited to hear your music. Um, how how has that reception been? And has it changed over the years? Um, so our school radio station, no one listens to that. Um, that that's just a thing that they do for you know because because why not? Yeah. Um, so that's not, you know, really boosting my following. I, I have a very small following of random people who, eh, maybe it's maybe more random people than I know, but you know, a few people reach out and say that, oh, I like this, this is good, and that's nice. It's nice to get positive feedback, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's mostly for me. Um, but yeah, especially, I mean, the obvious friends and family enjoy it, especially when they see themselves in it yeah. in a positive way. <laughs> Hopefully they don't know if it's them, if it's a negative way. Um, but, you know, every now and again I'll have someone tell me, like, I guess there's this one girl who, like, really likes it, really listens to it a lot, and I don't know her, I don't talk to her, but, like, my one of my friends is friends with her, and she's like, oh, yeah, like, Caitlin listens to this all the time, she loves it. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. Like, I've never spoken to her. Yeah. And then I'll get a message from some random guy in Indonesia, like, oh, my gosh, this is my favorite album. I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> like, you probably, like, wow, that's, I'm never going to meet this person, but they like my music. So that's always a good feeling. Um, but, you know, generally, it's, it's not, like, so big. Everyone's talking about it. They're playing at parties. Like, no, that doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great ride though. Yeah. It, it, I feel like uh, so many people don't get there, so. Yeah, I mean. That's something. It's, yeah, and it's just, it's for me, it's fun. It's, it's you know, if other people like it, that's great. I hope they do. But if they don't, then that's fine too. It's my music. <laughs> and so your, your, your originals, I've seen your bands have played some gigs. Do you ever do your originals out in the world, or is that just kind of a, a recording project? Um, so I... One time we played one of my originals with the band, um, and it went fine. I'm not the singer of our band though, so it was it was weird hearing like someone else sing my song, um, and it wasn't quite the same because we don't have all the same instruments. Um, and you know, we just have a different sound in general. We played better Sons and Daughters. I don't know if you. I love that song. Oh, good. I'm glad you do. Um, so you know, it's um, it's it was different. We didn't do it again, which you know. The band showed some interest in it, but I, I think, to me, they're two separate entities. Yeah. Sometimes I'll do like little open mic nights or coffee shops and do acoustic versions of my original music. Um, but obviously, live, I can't play everything at once. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess if I was really cool, I could. <laughs> but yeah, so it's generally speaking, yeah, it's just um, a recording project. But you know, we get some acoustic versions here and there. <laughs> I feel so much obliged to ask the um, you have a song on I think it's sort of pop that's called Kelleher Field. Mm, yeah. It's somewhat more local for people in Hudson. Um, is that about Marlboro Kelleher Field? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I went. I used to run a lot. I still run, but um, not like I did. And I was training for a half marathon. Jeez. Um, yeah, it was like sixth grade. I'm I'm not that cool anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> But my dad is very into running, so we ran together. Um, so that was that song is just basically a story of we ran that. It started at Carroll Trail Field, and there's like a trail. Yeah, so we ran down around there, um, and it was like the first time I ran 10 miles. And like I don't know, like looking back, that's one of the songs that I kind of like. Ooh, like 
That's kind of weird, but... No, we like that. Uh, I'm glad you like it. Um, yeah, my friend Mia sang on that track, um, and she's super talented. I Yeah, so that part I like. I like her voice. <laughs> there you go. Um, and going forward, you, you know, obviously you looking to get you know, some equipment back together, um, you know, going off to college next year, but, you know, I guess thinking more long term, you, you know, assuming you do get some equipment back, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you see music playing a role in your life in the future? Um, I definitely want to continue with it for sure. I mean, I still, I've have like a music Instagram I've been keeping up with that somewhat um, on my guitar but yeah definitely I hope to um, finish the songs that were not finished um, once I have the equipment to and then you know continue that into another album hopefully um, a full-length album this time <laughs> if we're lucky um, but yeah um, I, have, I have some stuff in the works some writing getting done in the meantime so yeah it should be it should be good hopefully you know another year or two and <laughs> we'll have another release. <laughs> I'm a fan. Alright. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. There you go. Alright. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That will wrap up our interview with Maggie Del Rey and likewise this episode of Three Pounds of Pure Culture. You can hear Maggie's music on Bandcamp or Spotify and can see some of her old covers on YouTube as well. For all of us here at HUD TV though, I'm Dakota Antelman. Thanks for listening.